Well, today's uh, reading for this service is taken from Professor Richard Dawkins, uh, who wrote an editorial just after the um, Haiti uh, earthquake. Uh, he was writing in response to um, an evangelist who I'll leave unnamed, and uh, the article was entitled, Hear the Rumble of Christian Hypocrisy. The evangelist who says the Haiti earthquake is retribution for sin is at least true to his religion. And this is what he says. We know that what caused the catastrophe in Haiti, it was the bumping and grinding of the Caribbean plate, rubbing against the North American plate, a force of nature, sin-free and indifferent to sin, unpremeditated, unmotivated, supremely unconcerned with human affairs or human misery. The religious mind, however, who bristically appropriates these blind happenings of physics for petty moralistic purposes, as with the Indonesian tsunami, which was blamed on loose sexual morals in tourist nightclubs, as with Hurricane Katrina, which was attributed to divine revenge on the entire of the new, uh, uh, which was attributed to divine revenge on the entire city of New Orleans for organizing a gay rally, as with other disasters going back to the famous Lisbon earthquake and beyond, so Haiti's tragedy must be payback for human sin. This infamous Tele-evangelist sees the hand of God in the earthquake, wrecking terrible retribution for a 1791 pact that the Haitians made with the devil to rid them of their French masters. 1791? Ah, but don't forget, I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Needless to say, milder-mannered faith heads fell over themselves to disown this evangelist, just as they disowned those other pastors, evangelists, missionaries, and mullahs at the time of earlier disasters. What hypocrisy, he writes. Loathsome, as these views undoubtedly are, he is the Christian who stands squarely in the Christian tradition. The agonized Theodosians who see suffering as intractable mystery, or who see God in the help, money, and goodwill that is now flooding into Haiti, or most nauseating of all, who claim to see God suffering on the cross in the ruins of Port-au-Prince, these faux-anguished hypocrites are denying the centerpiece of their own theology, it is the obnoxious evangelist who is the true Christian here. Dear modern, enlightened, theologically sophisticated, gentle Christian, you cannot be serious. Your entire religion is founded on an obsession with sin, with punishment and with atonement. Where do you find the effrontery to condemn this evangelist who you signed up to the odious, when you have signed up to the odious doctrine that the central purpose of Jesus' incarnation was to have himself tortured as a scapegoat for the sins of all mankind, past, present, and future, beginning with the sin of Adam, who, as any modern theologian well knows, never even existed. Yes, I know you hate the word scapegoat with good reason because it is a barbaric idea, but what other word would you use? The only respect in which scapegoat fails as a short, fails, falls short as a perfect epitome of Christian theology is that the Christian atonement is even more unpleasant. The goat of Jewish tradition was merely driven into the wilderness with a cargo of symbolic sin. Jesus was supposedly tortured and executed to atone for sins that any rational person might protest. Had he had it in his power simply to forgive, without agony, he would do. Among all the ideas ever to occur to a nasty human mind, Paul's, of course, referring to the Apostle Paul, the Christian atonement would win a prize for pointless futility as well as moral depravity. Now, it goes on, and I've already skipped a few paragraphs. Now, these are very hard words, and these are very difficult words for me to read as a Christian, and I'm sure for many of you to hear. And of course they are raised in the context of what is possibly the most difficult question any Christian can be asked, and the most difficult question that any believer in God can attempt to answer. And so what I would like to try to do for you this morning is pose an address on this issue of God of love, world of suffering, which is uh, different from what I did last night, to try to respond to this particular lines of criticism. Now, as I do so, I would also like to point you to um, a lecture by a colleague of mine, Professor John Lennox, who teaches at the Oxford Center for Christian Apologetics along with me, and is a professor of mathematics at the University of Oxford. He was in New Zealand a few weeks ago, speaking just three, four days after the earthquake, in Christchurch, the very city that was destroyed by the earthquake, and if you Google his name, L-E-N-N-O-X, and you just put Christchurch after it, you will find the series of five lectures and the public Q&A that he did there right in the immediate aftermath of the earthquake which, which hit 
that town and so decimated it and which we've now so easily forgotten because of what's happened in Japan. And I am, uh, I've spoken with him and I asked John if I could borrow parts of his outline and so parts of what I'm going to say with you I am borrowing very liberally from him and so the reason I'm pointing this out as well is that you may well want to listen to what he himself says and how he himself structures it. There are some significant differences but you'll also, if you listen to both, you'll also see there are significant areas of overlap as well. And this is a very difficult question. And so in no way do I want to minimize it. Now, for Richard Dawkins, of course, the earthquake, the Japanese one, what happened in New Zealand, the Haiti one he's writing about here, and so on, is entirely consistent with his worldview. And in that sense, you could arguably say he has done away with the problem of pain. In another book, he writes this. He says, in a, we live in a universe of blind physical forces and genetic replication. Some people are going to get hurt, other people are going to get lucky, and you won't find any rhyme or reason to it, nor any justice. The universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect. If there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, and no good. Nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. DNA neither knows nor cares, and we dance to its music. This is why Bertrand Russell, also reflecting on this theme, the well-known British atheist said that we have to reconcile ourselves to a radical, very radical um, uh, existence where there is no hope at, at any level at all. The way he put it was this, he said, we now need to build on a firm foundation of unyielding despair. Now, when Richard Dawkins was debating with Professor Lennox, and they debated three times, once um, over here in the States, uh, once on radio, which was recorded in, in Oxford, and then uh, once in the Science Museum at the University of Oxford, at one point, after the debate, Richard Dawkins just looked at John Lennox and said, it's bleak, but that is the way it is. Now, it has to be admitted that if this is correct, it completely does away with the problem of pain and suffering. Because there is no injustice, that's just the way it is. That is what we must simply accept. That is the reality. And we cannot find and ask a bigger question as to why and whether this world could have been any different. And that's a different type of question, and I'm going to try and answer that question at, at another time. But it is consistent. It does away with the problem. The difficulty it poses, however, it does away with a lot of other things as well. It does away with good and evil, right and wrong, justice. And so some people would argue in response to this that actually maybe this solution ultimately makes the problem even worse. Because it's not just the fact that we therefore live in a world where we see these things happen, we also live in a world which by definition there is no hope. We simply have to reconcile ourselves to a sense of unyielding despair. So, since Richard Dawkins wants to take this to the Scripture and to the Old and New Testaments, what I'd like to do is look briefly at the Old and New Testaments with you and just see what exactly it is that the Bible does have to say into this very, very difficult question. And I wish I had some easy answers here that I could give you. But I think there are some insights here which I hope will be helpful. Now, of course, we have an intellectual side to this problem, why? And then we have the existential side, what comfort is there? And of course, the intellectual side is very well known. The problem's been posed for thousands of years. So in the words of one ancient philosopher, is God willing but not able? In which case, he is impotent to do anything about this. Is he unwilling but able? In which case, he is malevolent. But if he is both willing and able, whence does all of this suffering come from? Now, it is interesting to note that the longest recorded conversation in the Bible by far is on this question, the question of suffering. And you'll find it in the book of Job. Now, the book of Job, of course, is a fascinating book. And what happens if you read the book of Job is you'll see that Job goes through a whole series of disasters. 
And this is what it says just halfway through the first chapter. It says, One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine in the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby. And the Sabaeans attacked and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The fire of God fell from the sky and burned up the sheep and the servants, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert, struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them, and they are dead. And I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. At this, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away May the name of the Lord be praised. Now listen carefully to the next line. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Now just after this, Job's wife wants to curse God and die. And for that, she is rightly condemned. But we are told that in doing what Job did and saying and reacting the way he did, that he did not commit any offense before God. And I would just like to start off by saying that if you are sitting here in the midst of pain and turmoil, and it feels, literally, that everything has been wiped away and the rug has been pulled from under your feet, you can come before God and talk to him. And what Job says to God is outstanding if you read the rest of the book. As a matter of fact, the theologians come along, the professional guys, and they say, Job, you must have done something wrong to deserve this. And they start trying to convince him of that case. And Job insists that can't possibly be true, and he has questions for God, question after question after question. When you get to the end of the book, God reaffirms his affirmation of Job. Job, in all of this you haven't sinned. But then God says, but you know those theologians who are trying to figure out the problem for you? Well, I'm pretty, uh, putting this now in sort of modern American, even though I'm English, I'm pretty pretty ticked at you. Is that a word you use? (laughs) I'm ticked at them, he says. I'm happy with you, but those guys... I am so offended by their so-called answers that you need to pray for them because they're in serious trouble. Now, please note as we read this scripture that the Bible is automatically distinguishing between two issues, and we see them both here. There are two sources of suffering. The first one comes from human evil, from the human heart. The Chaldeans come and they steal and they kill. And before them, we read of another tribe who also come and they kill and they steal. And they steal. This is what we call the problem of moral evil, properly titled the problem of evil. However, we also see a second problem described here, which we properly call the problem of pain in which no human agency is involved, where no human being can be blamed. When the hurricane comes, when the lightning falls, when the wind comes and blows the top of the house, and people die, and this is the problem of pain. Now these are two closely related issues. The problem of evil, which springs from a corrupt human nature, and the problem of pain. in which we talk about cancer, and tumors, and earthquakes, and tsunamis. Now, they are related. They are related in the fact that both of them describe a situation where nature has gone wrong. In moral evil, human nature has gone wrong. In the problem of pain, physical nature has gone wrong. And such is the sophistication and interlinking in the world in which we live, one can also affect the other. So something can go wrong in the physical nature, in your brain, which can actually cause you to do things which causes a problem now in your human nature, in your behavior. And those two can be connected. So the question then is, well, why does nature go wrong? Why? 
Now, the scientists, of course, may well say, well, this is the wrong question. Look, if you look at the history of the universe, they will say, we, this all started with a big bang. Then, of course, we had condensation out of that, which basically produced stars and galaxies. Now, as there was a cooling within the universe, planets began to form. So by the time you come to the Earth, there is a molten center, and floating on this molten sea are these huge tectonic plates that bump and rub up against each other. And that's just the way it is. There is no answer to the question, why? What we can simply describe is the what. Now what's more, they say, this formation of the Earth with a molten center is absolutely essential to human life. In a book that's recently come out of the University of Washington called Rare Earth, two leading scientists in this field say, that the tectonic plates and the movement of them is what actually supplies this world with water, which is essential to life. Also, the molten core generates a magnetic field which protects the Earth from cosmic rays, from which if we were not protected, all life would very quickly be eradicated. And so these things are actually essential to provide life. And of course, therefore, given how this is, there is, and I love how John Lennox phrases this, a ring of fire. If you decide to live near where these plates meet, you are living in a risky area. And when they bump and rub up against each other, there is a ring of fire within which there will be consequences. Now, not only that, of course, we have to add to this to the fact that there is also an inner ring of fire. As you and I sit here right now, given the size of the audience that is here and also sitting in, uh, in the other locations, we have no idea what is happening in our hearts and brains right now. Some of us have inherited genetic coding defects which will kill us. It could be in a week, it could be in months, it could be years. And then they say, and in all of this you expect us to believe that somehow there is a God of love involved in this, that it is somehow possible to be there. That's just the way it is. Now, what I would like to try to do, as I say, is having acknowledged the fact that this does set up potentially a consistent way at one level to deal with the problem of pain and suffering, it also has some inconsistencies in it too. I don't know if any of you have read any of Richard Dawkins' books. He has some very interesting moral judgments to make about God, especially the God of the Bible, who he describes in the most incredible terms sycophantic, homophobic, genocidal, and so on. It's amazing how at one hand he's prepared to deny there's any such thing as moral, morality, good and evil, while announcing, denouncing at the same time that God is actually evil, which raises the question where he gets the category of evil from if there is no good and evil. <laughs> he also wrote some very interesting things to say about President George Bush, who in Richard Dawkins' eyes is almost as evil as God himself. <laughs> and I don't want to make any comment about President George Bush or indeed President Obama, apart from to repeat what I said last night, which is whenever you want to end your rebellion and rejoin the British Empire, we're welcome to, <laughs> happy to welcome you. <laughs> but let's first of all deal with his first objection. His first objection, and if you read this editorial, he ends with it, and he, he talks about Christian apologists, and I am a Christian apologist. He says that I am a white and sepulchre that I am basically a spin doctor for the Christian faith, that my job is to portray God in the best possible light and ignore all the inconvenient bits, to somehow fool people into putting their faith and trust in this being. And he would then contrast this other person he's quoting and say, well, this is the true Christian faith. This is true biblical Christianity. What this guy said, that these people are being punished for their sin, that that's why the earthquake has come, Richard Dawkins says these people are squarely in the center of Christian tradition, are they? You know, Jesus had something to say about this, you know. Because this is a very serious error. So serious that Jesus himself decided that he himself would address it. You'll find what he has to say about it in the Gospel of Luke chapter 13. Now, there were some present at that time who told Jesus 
about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. All the 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Now notice again here, Jesus Christ is also making the philosophical distinction between the two categories of evil. He actually takes both. There is the moral evil, where this group of people, while they are offering sacrifices in the temple, are themselves massacred and killed. That's the problem of moral evil, springing from human nature. And at the same time, he uses another example of the tower falling on them. That's the problem of pain. And Jesus says, do you think these people were worse than you? And the answer is, no. That is the way not to read these events. So let's not do it. This is the way not to see it, says Jesus. I would like to suggest to Professor Richard Dawkins that if we are talking about someone who stands in the center of the Christian tradition, that Jesus Christ is at the center of Christian tradition. And so let us listen carefully to what he has said. And some of you in this room are suffering things that have nothing to do with what you have done. It potentially could be something that's been done to you by someone else, or it is simply the problem of pain. And you've inherited things from your parents and so on over which you had no control and no decision, and they have affected you. Now, of course, there are some deeper questions, because it is slightly more complicated than that. There are some things, and some diseases, for example, that are the result of sin. If every night I send myself to sleep by drinking a bottle of gin, and I have to say, last night I had one hour, 45 minutes sleep, so this was a tempting thought as I reflected on my message. <laughs> but I wasn't sure if the church was paying for the minibar bill, so I decided against it. <laughs> if I do that every evening, and I develop liver disease, there is a very clear linking between my sin and what I'm now suffering. Similarly, if I stood on this platform intoxicated, walked out into the parking lot at the end of this service, and reversed a car at great speed and ran over one of your children, there is a very clear link between what I have done wrong, my sin, and the suffering that you now suffer. But we have to be exceedingly careful here, because the disciples themselves were, making, were prone to making this mistake. At one point they see a man born blind, and they turn to Jesus and they say, why is this man blind? Is it because of his sin or his parents' sin? And Jesus said, neither. One of you said neither. It's neither. <laughs> we have to be very careful here. We have to be exceedingly careful here. These are very complex and deep issues. But let's not run these two problems together. Job, if you read verse 1, is the most righteous man on the planet Earth at the time he suffers. God says there is no one more righteous than he. Now, I know some of us think that we're more righteous than everyone else, and we'll be talking about that problem tonight. <laughs> and if you've met people who feel that way, then please do bring their names and addresses, and I will pay them a pastoral visit. But here, in this setting, we need to be very careful. Now, please note, Jesus' response is not easy. He does not say that they're not sinners at all. He doesn't say that. They are sinners. But so are we. We're all sinners. We've all messed up. We've all done things wrong. Now, I know this is a deeply unpopular Christian truth, deeply unpopular. I don't know if you know, but I, I would like to suggest to you it is true. I, I don't know if you know the story of a boy who wanted a bicycle for Christmas. And Christmas Eve came, 
and he searched the whole house from top to bottom, and there were no bicycle-shaped presents to be found. So he's now in a state of panic. He gets on his knees, and he leans up against the bed. He says, God, okay, I'll tell you what. I really want a bicycle for Christmas. So here's the deal. You give me a bike, and I'll be good for a month. Okay, one month, I won't do anything wrong. Just make sure that bicycle's there tomorrow morning. He gets into bed. He starts to think that a month is an awfully long time. He's always getting into trouble with his teachers in school. So he gets back out of bed. He gets down on his knees and says, okay, God, how about this? One week. I'll be good for a week. Just please make sure there's a bicycle. Thank you very much. Amen. He gets back into bed. Then it starts occurring to him how he often gets into trouble with his mother, doing things that he shouldn't do. A week is a long time. He gets back on his knees. He says, okay, God, I tell you what, one day, 24 hours. I won't do anything wrong. I'll lead a perfect life. In exchange, please send me the bicycle. He gets back into bed and he starts thinking how annoying his sister can be at times. <laughs> she sits at the dinner table with her finger one millimeter away from his shoulder. And when it makes contact with him, she says, my finger didn't move, he's the one who moved. And it frustrates him. And he thinks this isn't going to work either. He suddenly remembers that across the street from where he lives there's a small Catholic chapel. And he's aware of the fact that the door is often left unlocked so people can just go in any time, day or night. So he sneaks out of the house, he crosses the road, he opens the door to the chapel. As he walks in, there's a small stone basin filled with water, and above it, in a small alcove, there's a statue of Mary. He takes the statue, puts it in his pocket, sneaks back into the house, puts the statue in the wardrobe, locks the door, gets down on his knees, and he says, okay, Jesus, if you ever want to see your mother again. We are not as good as we like to think we are. <laughs> Except you repent, you too will perish. What does that mean? That unless we repent before God, we'll get hit by an earthquake? A tower will fall on us? No. What, God, what Jesus is saying is that our span on earth is finite. God has given us life and an opportunity to respond to him. And there will come a time when God will take it away. Now the trouble is we only think about these difficult questions when we see catastrophes on a huge scale that involve massive scale of life. The rest of the time we don't think about it. We're not that concerned because we don't see it. So we're not bothered by children we don't see starving to death halfway around the world who are dying right now even as I speak because that doesn't bother us. We don't see it. To argue as Professor Richard Dawkins has done, as I said, that at the center of the Christian theology, that this is what you must believe whenever you see a natural disaster come is simply not true. Now, of course, if I read the rest of the article, and I, I didn't, he then goes on to say, you Christians, you believe in demons. Now you're embarrassed by the fact, but Jesus went around claiming to drive them out. And how ridiculous is that? In the same article, I think it was C.S. Lewis who said, and you have to remember, he did a series, he wrote his book, Mere Christianity, which was the first a form of what were called the broadcast talks, which were broadcast during the Second World War. And I think it was him who made the analogy. He said, if you went into a major city and you saw a bombed cathedral, and as you looked at the structure, you could see something of its nobility and its beauty, and now you can see all of the damage and the devastation. He says, you would very easily conclude that an enemy has done this. This has come under enemy attack. In the same way, says Lewis, we may look at this world, which at some time is so beautiful, so noble, so wonderful, and at the same time so ravaged and damaged, that we might also reasonably conclude, an enemy has done this. Well, says Richard Dawkins, how ridiculous. How stupid to think this that we are not alone in this universe. Now, there was a very controversial film a, a short while ago called Expelled, and I, I don't want to say anything about that film in particular because some people love it, some people hate it. Um, I have to say I have some sim sympathy for some of the people who appeared in there because they thought they were appearing in something different to what it actually and eventually was. But nevertheless, at the end of that film, Professor Richard Dawkins has been interviewed, and he's been interviewed on the question of what's called intelligent design. And the interviewer says to him, 
keeps pushing him and says, what would you say if it turns out that your field, biochemistry, concludes that there is intelligent design and that human life is the result of intelligent design? And then he makes the most startling statement. I have to say, I was shocked. I, I had to stop it, rewind it, and play it again. I, the first time I ever watched this, I was actually sitting with a brilliant theoretical physicist from the University of Oxford, whose research, actually, if it actually comes to fruition, he will well be, and certainly be in line for a Nobel Prize. One of the most brilliant scientific minds I've met. He and I were sitting next to each other. He couldn't believe it either. I said, I just have to just rewind this. I, wanna, I can't believe the answer he just gave. Because this is the answer he gave. He said, it may well be the case, and it may actually be the case, that we will soon prove that human life is the result of intelligent design. But, he says, if that is the case, it will be because human life was seeded on this planet by alien life forms, who intelligently designed us and placed us here. And the key thing, he says, is that those alien life forms, their existence will be able to be explained through a purely random process that doesn't involve intelligent design. Do you see what he's saying? He's saying, yes, our science may well actually inevitably conclude that it's inescapable that we are intelligently designed. But that doesn't bother me, because if we prove that, and he said that may well actually prove to be the case. The word he uses is he says it's an intriguing hypothesis, and he says he thinks a very likely one. That the, the reason why we are designed is that we were designed by a superior alien life force that then seeded us here. And of course, he is not the first scientist to make this statement. So please don't laugh at it, because there are actually many people in academia, including the University of Oxford, who would say, actually, we think this is a likely hypothesis. Now, isn't it interesting, when the scientific community suggests that we're not alone in this universe, and there may be other life forms out there about which we know currently about, we listen with great attention and respect. But when the Bible says the same thing, we tend to scoff. We are not alone in this universe. There is an enemy at work. And this is tremendously helpful for us because it tells us that things which are going wrong in this world cannot all be set at the foot of human agency. There are other forces and factors at play here. Now this is, I realize that these are very difficult things. There are no easy answers here, ladies and gentlemen. I wish I had some simplistic thing I could slay before you that would address and deal with all of these issues, but they're simply not here. But let's just deal with the second part of his complaint. The first part, this is central to the Christian faith, this belief that this is why things happen this way. And I'm trying to say it's not. Here's the second part. The atonement, he says. The most morally disgusting, offensive doctrine that any perverted mind has ever come up with. And he blames that at the feet of the Apostle Paul. It was his twisted mind that came up with this terrible idea. Now the atonement refers, of course, to Jesus Christ's death on the cross. The fact that Christians would say that Christ died and suffered on the cross in order to rescue us from the moral evil that we have done and to redeem the world in which we live. And I would like to suggest to you that Christ's death on, his cro on the cross and his resurrection provide actually two things that speak directly into this issue, more directly than anything else that you could possibly come to. First of all, it deals with the issue of moral evil. There will be a day of judgment. The terrorists who flew into the Twin Towers on 9-11 and the Pentagon and everything else didn't, will not get away with it. There will be a day of reckoning. There will be a day of judgment. The Bible sings about the prospect of judgment. And I don't want to repeat anything I said on Friday night where we spent so much more time on this. Suffice to say that if you have been wronged and if you have suffered injustice, the idea of justice coming, of a right judgment being made, is sweetness to your life and to your soul. We cry out, how long, O oh Lord? When will you put things right? And the Bible tells us that God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world by the man he has appointed, Jesus Christ. 
There is a day of judgment. Justice will be done. The guilty will be punished. The existential struggle that we have in relationship to suffering, where we say this is not fair, this is not right, that someone did this to someone else, it's terrible, it is disgusting, it is awful, just look at what's happening in the Middle East right now and what people are doing to each other, indeed all around the world. Our subjective sense for justice is backed by God's objective moral justice and judgment. And he will judge and it will be fair and it will be true. Death is not the end. If death is the end of human life, then it is terribly unfair and it is terribly unjust just when another being cuts another human life short and nothing seems to be done about it. But the Bible teaches that we will live forever. Forever. That is a very long time. Now, for some people, the idea of living forever is terrifying. I mean, after you've gone to heaven and you've been there a few hundred million years, and you've sung, shine, Jesus, shine, a hundred million times. Have you sung that one? <laughs> then what are you going to do? Does God organize day trips to hell to break up the monotony of being in heaven? <laughs> we are told that at his right hand, when we are with him, there is pleasure forevermore. And when you take a small amount of suffering and you divide it by an eternal span of time, the Apostle Paul is able to say, our current afflictions are light and momentary compared to what God has for us. Death is not the end. Read the book of Job and ask yourself one other question. Is the God of the Bible big enough to be a God of compensation? For all that we have lost? John Lennox says, we cannot live with a boy's philosophy. It simply fails us as we go into adulthood. These are deep questions. We need deep answers. I would like to suggest to you that Jesus Christ and the Bible speaking to these issues with a level of depth and clarity that you will find unrivaled almost anywhere else. Secondly, this resurrection guarantees that there will be a restoration. Now, when Jesus was on the planet Earth, he did not heal everyone. And even when he raised Lazarus from the dead, he died again. And even when John the Baptist found himself in prison, having said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, John the Baptist himself begins to doubt as he begins to suffer and has to be reassured by the person of Christ personally that he is the one, even though John the Baptist himself will shortly after that be beheaded. The question at the experiential level is there, is there enough evidence of God and his character for us to hold on to him even when the times are difficult? And I'd like to suggest to you that there is. He has given us a foretaste of what is to come by raising Christ from the dead. There will be a restoration. And there will come a time when we'll be given new bodies. I can't tell you, ladies and gentlemen, how much I am looking forward to my new body. Now, every family should have a motto. My personal family motto is life is too short to be thin. <laughs> Some of you need to receive that prophetic word. <laughs> At the same time, we look forward to a time where there will be no more suffering, where there will be no pain, and where God will wipe away every tear. I don't know if you've ever tried wiping away someone else's tears from their eyes. We normally don't do that. If we ever wipe away someone's tears, we wipe them from the cheek. The reason is the eye is one of the most sensitive organs in the body. And if you try to wipe someone's eye, you can actually cause a lot of damage because you have no idea of the amount of pressure that you're putting on. But there is one who will wipe away every tear. And that is the person of Christ. So how can I draw this together? There are other questions I haven't I haven't answered. In, in, in the second service, we'll be doing something slightly different to try to answer some of the questions I haven't answered. If you are a Christian, you are not invited to come back. So please listen carefully. If you're a Christian, neither location, do not come back to church. 
Okay, you don't hear that that often. <laughs> but if you are a seeker, an inquirer, a skeptic, an atheist, totally unpersuaded but you want to find more, then, then you'll be more than welcome to stay. As a matter of fact, if that is you, come up to the front afterwards and I'll insist the church buy you a cup of coffee. <laughs> Believe me, this may be the only time it happens. <laughs> but how do we pull this together? There's the most amazing statement in the book of Revelation where it says, because of your will, they were and were created. Now, what does that mean? It means because of God's will, we are created and have our being. This answers the most profound existential question any human being can ask. Why am I? Why am I here? And the answer is, well, by God's will. He wants you to be. God wants your existence. He wanted you. And however long we are here on earth, and by whatever means that we eventually depart it, he wants us to be. We're only temporarily here. There is another world which is yet to come. So that then raises another question that we have to ask ourselves. The question is not, therefore, what world am I living in? The answer to that is obvious. The answer is, what world am I living for? What world are you living for? God wants us to be. He wants relationship with us. The way he has done this is that he has shed his own blood willingly. He was not tortured on the cross. No one took Christ's life from him. Jesus said, freely I lay my life down, and freely I take it up again. And just in case you didn't get it, he then says, no one takes my life from me. He freely and willingly comes in this world to pay a price to make it possible for us to have relationship with him. Let me try to illustrate it this way. One of my uh, colleagues is with me, uh, Larry Griffith, sitting down here. Um, we're the only ones I see in sort of like smart clothes. <laughs> that's because actually I don't have casual clothes. I don't have that kind of money. <laughs> if any of you would like to write to Ravi Zacharias about that, then I'd appreciate it. But let's suppose you I, after this meeting, you hear me talking with Larry. And I'm calling him every name under the sun. I'm shaking with anger. I'm insulting him, his wife, his mother, and anyone else I can think of. And you were, you were going to ask me a question, but you rightfully feel disgusted, and you just walk out the back of the room. The next morning, you see me having coffee. And you come up, and you say, you know, I was at church yesterday morning. I don't normally go, but I, I saw you there. And I say, oh, great. You say, you were talking to that guy, Larry, at the end of the service. H how were things between you and him? And I say, they've never been better. You know, I have an intimacy and a connection with Larry that I don't think I enjoy with any other human being. What would you think of me? I mean, seriously. Now, you see, the trouble is you're not Pentecostal enough and you're too polite. I can think of lots of words to describe myself, most of which I can't speak into the microphone. I mean, what kind of insensitive, inhumane, arrogant human being must I be to make that kind of statement? I mean, you would have to have the emotional intelligence quotient of zero to come to that conclusion, right? There's only one set of circumstances under which that statement of mine may actually be true. Let's supposing, after everyone has left, Larry takes me out and says, Michael, I, can I just talk with you about what you were saying to me earlier? And he extends grace to me. He extends forgiveness to me. And as he talks, I become painfully aware of the fact well, what I said was completely, totally, and utterly wrong. And I say, Larry, I'm wrong. Not I'm sorry I hurt your feelings, which is how most men apologize to women, by the way, which is completely wrong, but that's a whole other message. <laughs> but I am wrong. When I confess that I am wrong 
And when Larry is willing to forgive me, my confession that I am wrong allows me to receive the forgiveness that he is willing to offer me. And it may well be, as we talk into the early hours of that morning, that we develop a bondship, a bond and a friendship that is deeper and more meaningful than anything I have ever known up until that point. And when you come and ask me, how is everything between you and him? I am speaking the complete, total and utter truth. This is precisely what God has done for us. On the cross, he is seeking us out. He is actually paying the price for what we have done wrong. He is actually settling that account and he is offering us forgiveness. And if we repent, if we say, I am wrong, we receive that forgiveness and that new life from him. And we're in relationship with him. And God wants relationship with us. He wants you. By his will, you were and were created. It was his will that you are here. He wants you. And he has held nothing back. And he has done everything that is needed to make it possible for you to know him. Do you know him? Well, look, at the end of this service, whether you're here or whether in one of the other locations, if you are sitting here today and you know, you know, that you need to say yes to Christ. That you know where you stand before him. You are willing to say you are wrong. You know who he is. You understand this atonement. And you want to receive him. Then come and find someone and just say, look, could I just talk with you? Now, if you are not sure, you cannot become a Christian because you feel emotionally you know, manipulated into a particular corner. That, that doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Okay, that is a disaster. When you feel emotionally manipulated by somebody, even though you're saying, forgive, you're saying sorry, this is what's happening, you feel emotionally bad about what you've done. Okay? So you want to not stop feeling emotionally bad. So you go to God and you say, God, I'm really sorry, forgive me. And you take the forgiveness paper and you walk away and hey, you feel better for a while. Okay? And then you do the same thing again. So you go back to God and you say, okay, I'm sorry, I did it again. And you take the forgiveness paper, and you feel better about yourself. And you walk away. And then you do something bad again, and you feel bad about yourself. And you go to God and say, look, God, please forgive me, I feel really bad. And you take the shit of paper, and you walk away, and you feel better about yourself. Eventually, that process becomes meaningless. Because it's about you. It's about trying to make yourself feel better. That is not the reason why you want to be forgiven by someone. There's a writer called John Piper. I don't know if any of you know him. Um, uh, he's a remarkable writer. He's the strongest Calvinist I know. I don't blame him for that. He had no choice in the matter. God made him that way. <laughs> if you don't know what that means, it doesn't matter. God made you that way. Now, by the way, if you think you're an Armenian, you only think you made that choice. But anyway, there's another debate. <laughs> Piper gives the following analogy. He says, supposing my wife and I have had a fight. She storms out of the room. Now, sometimes my wife and I, we have disagreements. We had more disagreements when she bought a thing called a laundry basket and put it in her bedroom. The theory is that you put your dirty laundry in the basket. Now, I used to be captain of the basketball team. So I like to shoot my laundry long distance across the diagonal. Sometimes it goes in. Sometimes it's a near miss. Sometimes it hangs from the lampshade. My wife finds this troublesome. <laughs> Let's suppose she comes into the bedroom, you know, and basically it's sort of four in, six out, and three hanging. <laughs> and she says, why on earth is it too much effort for you when you take off your socks to put them in the laundry basket? And because I'm tired, I tell her exactly what I feel she can do with the laundry basket. <laughs> she walks out of the room. I walk out after her. I, I walk into the kitchen. You could cut the atmosphere with a knife. What needs to happen here? Well, the answer is obvious. She needs to apologize. No, 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 I need to apologize. <laughs> right. Now, here's the point, says Piper. Why? Why do you want her forgiveness? So that she'll make your favorite breakfast. So the kids won't see you fighting. So there'll be good sex tonight. He says, all of those things may become true, but they are all defective motives for wanting to be forgiven. The reason you want to be forgiven is you want the sweet fellowship with your wife back. 
She is the reason you want to be forgiven. And it is the same with God. We go to him not to take a forgiveness chip to make ourselves feel better about ourselves, to make our guilty feelings go away. He is the reason we want to be forgiven. We want to be in relationship with him. So if you know who he is and you know that that's the position you're in, maybe you're wandering, maybe you've been thinking about it for a while, come and find someone. Now, if you're not sure, this church runs groups called starting point groups. So here's how those work. You find a group of, you sign up. We'll get a group of atheists and agnostics and you gang up on one of the pastors here. You sit them down, you make them give you coffee, and then you ply them with questions. They're being paid. Make them work for a living. (laughs) If you are not sure, why not take that form that you have in your brochure, tear off that slip, and say, okay, sign me up for that. This is not a brainwashing course. A group from the church will not come to your place of work with a guitar and start singing Kumbaya to you (laughs) in your lunch break. It's an opportunity for you to find out, but please do find out. Ladies and gentlemen, these are very difficult questions. There are no easy answers, but there is one who says he is the answer. He is the resurrection and the life. My prayer is that you may all come to know him, regardless of whatever turmoil you may find yourself in, because he alone is the one who can give us peace now and peace to be with him in a world yet to come. Thank you for listening to me. You've been very gracious and kind.